The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, Take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If a shepherd has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, doesn't he leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones should be lost. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If you're listened to, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you the truth, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. church. Grace to you and peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The word church, ecclesia in Greek, only appears in two places in the Gospels. It appears lots of times in the book of Acts and many times in the epistles, but Jesus only mentions the church twice and only in Matthew's Gospel. In fact, we heard him say the word church for the first time a few weeks ago, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus came back with, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. The first time we hear of the church, it is ascendant. A church that death itself cannot prevail against. A church built strong on the rock of the faith of Peter, who proclaims the living God, come as Christ in love. This church is a glimpse of God's beloved community of life and of love, and it is beautiful. And now, here we are, two chapters later, and when Jesus speaks of the church, this time it is in conflict and disarray. Jesus describes a wounded church where members are hurting each other, and won't listen to each other. And the church represents the last-ditch effort to restore the peace. It's messy. These two chapters tell a tale of two churches, the best of times and the worst of times. So divine and so human, beautiful and messy. And isn't that just like the church? Because church often is messy, isn't it? Even this church. I haven't been here long, but I've been reading the wonderful history of Mount Olive that was put together for the 100th anniversary, 
And it's been such a lovely way to get to know the rich history of this place. But it also is a tale of two churches, at least two. There have been many beautiful moments and many messy moments in this place. And in the wider church as well, some of you shared with me this week your own painful stories of the messy church and the ways that you were brought down and let down, sometimes by people who sanctioned their actions with these very texts. It's all too easy for two or three people to claim the authority of God to push out of the flock some sheep that makes things just a little bit too messy, whose sins, real or imagined, threaten the idea of the beautiful church. And these conflicts weigh us down, and they hurt. It's heartbreaking. And in my cynical moments, I think about God's promise to do anything we ask, if two of you can agree. And I imagine God thinking, oh, I'll take that bet. <laughs> two of you need to agree? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, if two of you can agree on anything, I'll do it. Good luck. <laughs> but of course, that's not how God thinks or what God wants. God wants us to agree, wants us to love one another, and wants us to live. Telling the prophet Ezekiel, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways. And live. But how? How do we turn and live? How do we muddle through the messiness of life side by side? Well, God has given us a good place to start. It's called the law. We Lutherans love gospel so much that we often like to give the law a bad name, but the law is a gift. It's supposed to help us. It's supposed to be a good thing. It was the desire and the delight of the writer of Psalm 119. And it's what Paul offered to the Romans, who were trying to navigate their own very messy church. And Paul helpfully summarized for them and for us that the law is really just love. Love for our neighbors, so that we can turn and live, and so that maybe we can be the beautiful version of the church a bit more often. But as helpful as the law is, the love and life that we find in Jesus goes even beyond that. This passage in Matthew is often called the rule of Christ, but it isn't just sensible conflict management advice. This is the kind of love that doesn't just follow the law, it fulfills it. The kind of love that goes out and finds that one sheep that was astray. The love that doesn't want a single one of these little ones to be lost. The love that brings every single one back. And that's what we're commanded to do here. If a sibling in Christ has sinned against you, has hurt you, has offended you, has annoyed you, whatever it is, you don't shut the door on them, and you don't take it like a doormat. You go out, and you meet them face to face. You might need to bring others along. You might need to bring along the whole dang messy church, if you need to, for the sake of one. That is restoration and reconciliation that will go to every length which sometimes means that we need to be a little bit flexible for the sake of reconciliation. We need to learn how to lean in to the messiness. And sometimes that even means re-evaluating the rules the law has given us. And God gives us this flexibility. Jesus says, not once, but twice, in both the passages where he mentions the church, the same phrase, 
Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This isn't God setting us up like little tyrants with terrifying cosmic power. This is God reminding the church to go to every length, to reconcile, to restore, to turn to life. You aren't bound to the law. If the law isn't working to bring every sheep back, be released from it. And if you need a few new rules to help you love each other into life, go for it. You aren't bound to the law, you are bound to each other. Which means that when you need to hold someone accountable, which sometimes you will, you can't forget to hold them. Too often, these passages are used to wash our hands of those who have hurt us and those we don't think should be part of the church. And sometimes we are so afraid of the messy church that we want to skip right over to the beautiful church and that we're really tempted to read that last part about Gentiles and tax collectors as license to exclude, to leave those sheep to wander on their cliffs. But that isn't the church. We only need to look at the way that Jesus treated Gentiles and tax collectors. Jesus wasn't afraid of messy. Jesus knew that the two churches, beautiful and messy, are really one church. Because the church that death cannot prevail against is the same church that's desperately trying to hold itself together. One church, bound in Jesus, who has already gone to every length to reconcile us to God, to bring us back to the fold, and who doesn't want to see a single one lost. And dear church, Jesus is here. He promised, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am among them. In my beautiful, messy church, I am among them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.